All right, so in this section, we're gonna talk about how you describe language. So a lot of terms and the International Phonetic Alphabet. So we're really gonna cover um, more in depth a lot of the words you'll need to know for the rest of the semester. So let's go. Um, so today we're really gonna talk about talking. And so it's kind of fun um, because you'll get to see how words are made in English anyway, and some of the issues that we have with words, and then we're gonna build up from there. So we're gonna start small with phonemes, and work our way up to complete syntax and how that works. All right, so um, if we were to study phonemes, we would be looking at acoustics. So acoustics is the study of the properties of sound, so the sound waves themselves, the length, the wavelength, the uh, formants, so the peaks in language, um, and that's especially useful for trying to understand the differences in vowels and consonants um, because those have different wavelengths and wave heights. Um, <clears throat> so any type of sound spectrogram is the amount of energy present, physical energy, when um, we plot the way people talk. So um, here are a couple examples. And so it shows you the frequency um, that someone's speaking at. So this is energy, and this is time across here. So this is from Rice, so this is somebody pronouncing the university name. And you can see that um, <clears throat> consonants and then vowels are have very different patterns. And so it's a way to study sounds at the lowest level. Um, we're not so interested in that as much as we are about phonemes and phonetics. So phonetics is the acoustic side where we would study how things are spoken. Phonology is how those sounds are made. And we're really interested in um, how those are interpreted in the individual. So we're gonna study phonemes in a way to understand better what's happening um, as people are processing words. So the biggest split when we're talking about phonemes is if they're either aspirated or they're not. So the great thing about this being online is that you have to play along at home, but nobody else see you. So you don't have that embarrassing class weirdness. Um, but be sure you try these at home. So aspirated phonemes are made with breath. So hold your hand in front of your face like this and feel, you kind of have to get close, feel how words are, are, are voiced um, and see if there are sound coming out of them. Sorry about that, my computer froze. So back into here. So we have our hands in front of our face and we're looking at aspiration. So not goals in life, but um, whether or not sounds are voiced. So what you wanna do is hold your hand in front of your face and say the word pen. So you should feel that burst of air that happens when you say those words. So pen versus unaspirated sounds where sounds are made without breath. So spin, it's still a P, it's still a P, so you would expect it to be aspirated, but it's not because of the S in front of it. So spin, 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 and pen um, are different phonemes, so they're aspirated differently. Okay. So you have to be able to understand if things are aspirated, so the easiest way to do that is just hold your hand in front of your face. Okay. And so phonemes are those basic units of sound. Um, and so what are the basic phonemes in English? Well, there's about 40 to 45, whereas there's only 26 letters. So you have all of your vowel sounds, A, E, I, O, U, Y is a special sound. Um, and then we have consonants and consonant clusters, which cover the rest of those sounds. Okay. So allophones are phonemes that vary in their different ways to say the same phoneme. And so this is gonna be a big problem with the English language is that um, it's called the many-to-many -many problem. We'll get there in just a second. But there are lots of ways to say the same phonemes. Uh, and apparently, there's a lot of ways for my cat to get on my nerves today. But we're going to keep going. So um, the biggest issue, one of the biggest issues, if you are um, Chinese trying to learn English, is the LR problem. Uh, and so I don't know that this clip would totally fly today because it's pretty culturally insensitive, but it's a great example of the L to R problem.
Okay, let's try again. So the L to R problem is the fact that to non-native English speakers, um, sometimes L and R has no distinction. So in Chinese, there is no distinction between those two. And um, so it sounds the same. And so learning to distinguish between those phonemes is incredibly difficult and often um, either takes a long time or you just can't get them because you just don't physically hear it. Um, English has the same problem with hearing things in other languages. It's just the L to R problem is really famous and there's a good Christmas story clip for it. <clears throat> but uh, with phonemes, there are, we talked about allophones, so different ways to say the same phoneme. There's also things called minimal pairs. So minimal pairs are two words that differ by only one sound. So you think of minimal pairs as rhyming words. So um, an interesting problem that we have in English is that things look like they should be minimal pairs and often they aren't. So we've got cave, save, wave, dave, and then have. Have is a stupid word um, because it's a, um, a uh, non, uh, it doesn't match the spelling to speech rules. It's an irregular word. Uh, and so when children are learning how to read and sounding things out, it can be incredibly difficult because it doesn't follow those normal rules. It doesn't map onto previously learned minimal pairs. Okay. And that becomes a super important when we talk about dyslexia here in a little while because um, dyslexia is a problem with, with uh, sounds. Usually there are other types, but the most common type is a sound issue. And so uh, you have trouble with minimal pairs. You can't play rhyming games. So we're gonna cover the International Phonetic Alphabet. So it's a standardized way of representing phonemes. So the link here will take you to where I got these pictures from. So if you've seen these in uh, dictionaries or online where they talk about how to pronounce things and then it gives you examples of all these different little symbols, you don't have to know the symbols you do have to understand the different pieces that go into those. Uh, so IPA is actually really quite complicated, but we're just going to cover kind of the basics of voicing. So why should we even learn this? Um, and especially because it has a lot of sort of seemingly random definitions. And what's really important is that it's called the many-to-many -many problem. So English has many spellings for one phoneme. Uh, photo, cough, fish, puff. All and though all have the wait, photo, cough, p fish, puff. There's one more word, but I can't remember. Um, all have the same sound, that f sound, but one a bunch of different spellings. So that's really hard if you're trying to learn how to spell. Um, and then the reverse is true as well. So one s uh, spelling can have a whole lot of sounds. So this is our pint and mint, uh, cave and have. So we have issues going sort of both directions, that one spelling has many sounds and many sound, and one sound has many spellings. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between sounds and symbols, um, which makes it very pretty difficult to learn English. So this is sort of rule number one why English is dumb. Um, but also it makes it a difficult thing for your brain to process. Okay. So American and British English, so there's two forms of English. Uh, this is an Eddie Izzard clip, and we'll see if it'll uh, copy well, but if not, you can open it up on your own and watch it. Um, and he talks a little bit about the differences between American and British English. Now, um, let's want to talk quickly about language, and then we can all... Because, uh, yeah, language, they do say Britain and America are two countries separated by the Atlantic Ocean. And, uh, and it's true. They say two languages separated by two countries separated by common language. That's the line. It's a uh, it's an Oscar Wilde line, I think. 
And we do pronounce things in a different way. Like you say caterpillar, and we say caterpillar. And uh, <laughs> you say aluminum, we say aluminium. You say centrifugal, we say centrifugal. You say leisure, we say lysurae. <laughs> Uh, and you say basil, we say basil, and you say herbs, and we say herbs, because there's a fucking H in it. All right, so the rest of the clip is actually really great, too. He goes on to talk about uh, multilingualism, um, and so I highly recommend Rest to Kill in just a general way because Eddie Izzard is hilarious, but also there's a big section on language and why... Um, Europe is so much better at language than we are, so. All right. Um, and so there's also, in, in um, England anyway, there's the Queen's English. That's the proper way of speaking. So think of kind of the My Fair Lady. Um, but it often doesn't really get used that way anymore. Class is not totally tied to speech. Um, but if you think about in the U.S., we do still have that perception of um, people who speak better or higher class. Um, so we're still that sort of problem of that we have we have an expected version of English that we perceive as better than other versions of English. Okay. And that's where dialect comes in. So my favorite part about the word dialect is that it's the worst word for me coming from Texas to say because it's just so hard to say without saying with a terrible Texas accent. It's dialect. <laughs> Um, my husband makes a lot of fun of me because I say right and bright. So there's a lot of um, nasal eye twang for me coming from Texas. But there's a lot of different accents. So I'm spending the summer in New Jersey and listening to people talk is just amazing because it is so wildly different. I'm sure they think I'm a dumb southerner. Um, but uh, there's that sort of uh, northern, northeastern accent that has the really strong consonants. Um, and so, you know, it's Boston, that sort of thing. Uh, even in Missouri, there's the Boot Hill accent that people say they can pick out. For me, anytime someone is from Georgia, it's very clear the instant they start talking. Um, people have an idea of what Texas sounds like, what California sounds like. So there's lots of different dialects within, um, the U.S., and especially within smaller uh, groups. So if you are talking to people from, um, let's say Jersey, they can tell you where different people are from based on those small distinctions in those individual dialects. Uh, so dialect is often used as a marker of like where people are from, which has anthropology reasons why it's a good thing, but it also um, creates a sort of interesting variation across the country. Okay. Um, so generalized American is sort of considered accentless speech where you can't really pick where the person's from. And this actually is a history when Southwestern Bell was sort of creating their global empire. Um, they used what they considered generalized American or accentless speech to record those annoying phone uh, sayings, like the number that you've called has been disconnected or um, this number is no longer in service. Uh, when people use real telephones and not cell phones. But where in the U.S. would you say is accentless speech? If you had to pick an area of the country, where would that be that you would consider accentless? Okay. And you might be surprised, it's actually considered the Midwest. Um, not so much Missouri, but Illinois, Nebraska, Iowa, um, but the Midwest uh, is considered accentless speech or general American where people have a hard time telling where someone's from. Um, another interesting thing is uh, Stephen Colbert. He's actually from Cal uh, South Carolina. And he says he's, he has a, he's famous for saying that he worked really hard to eliminate his accent because he perceived that um, Southerners were portrayed as stupid on American TV. And so he didn't want to sound like a Southerner on his show because people would perceive him as stupid. And so he worked really hard at not having an accent. So there are also uh, cultural issues tied to, tied to different phonologies, different phoneme pronunciations, which is what uh, dialect is. 
So, getting more into the actual physical structures that we use. Um, so the larynx is a voice box. It's here. And so uh, this kind of has it blown up here. But this piece here, which is the most important part of being able to talk physically the way we do. If we didn't have this voice box, we would not be able to make the sounds we do. And um, the setup for it is actually quite genius because of all the different ways that you can pronounce things. And so we're gonna break this into vowels. Um, vowels, so A-E-I-O-U, are modified by uh, moving the vocal tract here, and they're made with the mouth open. So if you hold your hands here, about where your lymph nodes will be, and just say A-E-I-O-U, you can feel the voice tract moving. So what's happening is this is changing here, and the shape is um, moving, uh, as generally always made with your mouth open. So many, um, many consonants cannot be pronounced with an open mouth. So you cannot make a B without the front of your lips. So uh, vowels are usually very open. Consonants are pronounced by changing the lip structure and then where the tongue goes. So um, vowels are often shaped too with the shape of the tongue, not the placement of the tongue. That's consonants, but the shape of the tongue. So try again, A-E-I-O-U. You can feel the back of the mouth especially um, changing the way the tongue is shaped. And then diphthongs. Diphthongs are where Y comes in. Um, diphthongs are two vowel sounds, so boy. Um, so anytime you have a sort of oi sound, um, that's considered a diphthong. So it's two vowel sounds combined. We have very few of these in English. They're more common in languages like French, um, where it has that O-E-U kind of craziness. Um, <clears throat> but diphthongs are anytime you have two vowels. Okay. So vo vowels on one side, consonants on the other. So this next section is all about consonants. Um, so vowels are generally, um, there's a lot of different ways that vowels are voiced. Uh, we're not going to cover a lot of that because it doesn't really add anything. So you know the vowels are made with the vocal tract and the shape of the tongue. Whereas consonants are made by closing or restricting different parts of the vocal tract. And they're usually made with a vowel sound after them. So if you think about saying P, you can't just say the letter P or the letter C. You get that E sound at the end. So P, B, T, D, K, G. You can feel the differences, especially if you say them kind of slowly on how it is um, changing inside your mouth. Okay. So there are two ways to classify consonants. They're either voiced or not. So voiced um, means that the vocal cords are vibrating. And so you can feel that here. So consonants are either voiced or they are not. And the placement of the articulation. So they'll place them where the vowel tract is placed in the vocal tract that is closed, duh, with a D, to articulate the word. Okay. So it's either vibrating or it's not. And then it is articulated in a specific spot. Okay. And I'm really interested in you um, at least thinking about, you may not totally remember all of these perfectly, um, but thinking about how these are articulated especially. It's so a bunch of different articulation places and I'll try to give you some examples. So a bilabial, labial meaning the lips here, so bi meaning two, are um, anything that is used by sort of pursing the lips. So P sounds, P, you have to push them together and come apart. B sounds often come across, uh, come in this place too. So P is voiced because it vibrates, but is a voiced bil bilabial. Not all P's are voiced, right? So spin is not voiced. Spin, okay, a little less vibration. Um, alveolar, so that's the teeth. It's the ridge behind and above your teeth. So you have your teeth, it's the one right, um, it's not directly behind your teeth, it's uh, above your teeth, so it's kind of where the palate starts. Um, and those are things like T, so you can feel the tongue hitting the top of the mouth above the teeth, um, so any kind of T sound. 
T's are complicated, depends on where the T is in the word. But dentals are the, is the tongue to the back of the teeth. So this is lower than an alveolar, so the. If you say T, it's upper in the mouth, the lower in the mouth. So um, dentals hit the teeth, alveolars hit the ridge above the teeth. Labiodentals is the lower lip to the top of the teeth, so we can see it's a combination of, of the two, previous two we've been talking about. So that's usually an F sound, so F, F anything like this. A postalveolar is the tongue on the roof of your mouth, on that ridge all the way in your palate. So these are actually fairly unusual words, but vision, you can feel that the, not the tip of the tongue, but the whole tongue kind of hits the roof, the palate. So she, um, and then vision. So it's, it's a lot of sh, sh sounds and um, sort of Z sounds. So um, not S's. Um, S often makes this, but uh, it's not an, a totally an S thing. Um, so she, sh, and you can feel that the air flows through the, the small space that's left uh, on the palate and vision. Uh, and so Z sounds as well. Okay. Palatals are where you actually hit the uh, tongue to the middle of the palate and not just kind of the outside. So you, this is where your sort of your whole, the back of your throat too will kind of constrict and come up. Um, so uh, kind of working from po post alveolars to palate, we're just adding more tongue, so to speak. That sounds incredibly dirty, but we're adding more tongue to the palate. Um, velars are where the tongue is all the way up. So it's the very back of the mouth, and this is generally G sounds, so get. Uh, you can feel the whole throat tightens up, and uh, these are generally not voiced because there's no oh, um, air to vibrate. So get, and they're not aspirated either, okay? Um, and so these last couples are kind of the hard ones, not the labiodentals, that one's pretty easy. But they're, what they're really talking about is how the tongue is moving in the mouth. So post alveolars are where the tongue creates this sort of tunnel um, for, for the, the air to go through through the palate. Uh, platals kind of are the middle of the mouth, and velars are all the way in the back of the mouth. So things without the tongue, there are things called voiceless, so um, no vibrations, glottals, fricatives, and this is where H's come in. So H's are weird in English because they don't often get pronounced. So hit, him, so those are not vibrating. It's coming all from the glottis. Okay. Um, glottal stops are sounds that are produced by totally closing the glottis, and this tends to be what we consider a hard sound. So German, um, when we consider a harsh language, which, you know, it went to Germany last summer and it really does not sound anything like what it's like on TV. It is not nearly as like, um, uh, harsh and hard as I would have thought it would have been. So cultural competence moment. Um, but glottal stops are when, um, the, the sound is completely cut off. So bottle, um, that T sound there. <clears throat> Um, so the manner of our articulation is the way that the airstream is, is constricted. So voicing, back up, back up, back up, boop, boop, boop. okay, so voice versus non-voiced uh, is about the sort of our vocal cords vibrating and then the place of the articulation is important. So that's kind of a sum of what we've been talking about here. Okay. Um, some other ways that we can look at voicing is uh, the way the air flows itself. So stops are complete interruptions in the airflow. So voicing here too is kind of in this section. These are the weird ones. Um, but stops are where you completely interrupt those airflows. So um, glottal stops are interrupted by the glottis. Other stops don't have to be interrupted by the glottis. So you can see this is quite complex. Um, so T. Fricatives are formed that the air rushes through with a hissing sound instead of a vibration. So F. Okay, so there's no, in theory, the vocal tract is not vibrating. You'll still feel the, still feel something vibrate here, so f, f, but you'll notice that it's way less than other sounds. And then A fricatives are a combination of a brief stop and then a constriction. So it's kind of um, 
a stop and then a hiss. So cheese. <laughs> um, so anytime you feel your throat, your throat kind of go, Arr! that's an affirmative. But cheese is one of my favorite words, so I just think it's kind of fun. So liquids are where the air flows around the tongue. And so they're very open. Uh, so L and R, you'll see that there's almost no tongue pronunciation, pronunciation, <laughs> movement. So L, R, those are really open mouth words. Uh, nasals are anytime it flows through the nose cavity. So for me, that's ah. Um, so anytime you have to make that kind of ah, nose wrinkling, that's a nasal. Glides and semi-vowels are sort of the way that we transition from one vowel to another. So way is an example. It's kind of like a diphthong, um, but it's the way that we sort of slide from one to piece to another. So, so moving from phonemes up the chain in, um, in uh, describing language, syllables are rhythmic units of speech. Um, and so syllables are often uh, ways to describe uh, minimal pairs. So the onset is an initial consonant or cluster for a syllable, and the rhyme is the end of a word that produces the rhyme. So rhymes often are vowel consonant or vowel consonant consonant. So if I have rent, you have a r and the ant, so I know it should rhyme with other ant words. Right, so this is how we can also have problems, though, when words um, onset rhymes don't match. So cave, uh, mint, in, mint and pint are a little easier to talk about. So mint, we have our onset n and int, but pint, we have our onset p and int. And those don't rhyme, even though they have the same literal rhyme, this word rhyme. Okay. Um, so uh, this word rhyme is the end of the word that should rhyme with meaning it um, sounds the same. So syllables are stressed differently. So um, we are a stressed time language. So we have the same timing for syllables. Uh, and so I've said this in the last one where we put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. This is one of my band directors, very favorite things to say. If I can get this clip thing to work here. Nope, too far. From the top. Assess the window. It's assess the window. You put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. I, so it's a, a linguistic joke. Uh, but anytime you hear someone say this, you look at them and like, oh, that's weird because it's not what you were expecting. It, um, and so this is where we're going to stop and take a break. And we'll come back and do part two here in a minute.